Well, joining me now is retired Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis, now a military expert and senior fellow with defense priorities. And also with us, Jill Doherty. She is the former CNN Moscow bureau chief and now an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Welcome, both of you. Lieutenant Colonel, let's begin with this news this week. Multiple reports of the role that the U.S. has played in providing Ukraine with intelligence, one involving the movement of high-ranking Russian military officials. The other, obviously, what you just heard, Russia's flagship cruiser, the Moskva, being sunk. Uh, we should note the U.S. is denying playing a role in its sinking. But, but is this helpful to have these leaks out there? Well, no. I mean, without question, it's, it's not helpful to have those kinds of leaks because we don't know how they're going to be used and certainly how they're going to be twisted around uh, in ways that are antithetical to our interests uh, in Russia, in Moscow, whether at the Putin level or, or just even in the, their population. Uh, I don't think anyone's surprised uh, that we're providing intelligence help, but I, I do think uh, that what uh, Kirby said was probably accurate in that we provide probably a whole range of uh, intelligence, and there's probably a number of different aspects of this war that we provided as, uh, information on, and then Ukraine does make its own decisions about what it will and what it can attack, uh, and then they go from there. So I, I think that there's some some truth to it, but. I, I do worry about us crossing a line, and I, I think that's something that the administration is right in being careful about. Yeah, because uh, up until now, the U.S. had been pretty discreet. Most people had assumed that the U.S. was providing some sort of intel to the Ukrainians, but perhaps it was more helpful not to be this specific. And now we have these two back-to-back -back reports this week. Jill, talk about that. How right. does this play into the Kremlin's narrative that this war now is not between Russia and Ukraine, but in fact between Russia and the West? And, and perhaps that this helps them save face given the setbacks they continue to have two months or almost two and a half months in. Actually, both, I think, Biana, of those points are very good. Number one, uh, the, obviously, uh, President Putin has been talking about this as a conflict, not just with Ukraine, but with NATO and the United States, who he would say use Ukraine as a weapon against Russia. And then the second part, which I think is really important that you mentioned, is this is a way of, uh, since this war for Russia is not going well, it is a way of Vladimir Putin saying that, um, you know, it's not really Ukraine that we are fighting. It's really NATO. It's really the West. Hence, if we don't do as well as we thought we were going to do, that's the reason. Because it is really ignominious for them, for Russia, to admit that it could be bested by Ukraine. So I think there are a number of, you know, different messages going on here. Yeah, and that is the message that we've seen over the past few weeks on Russian state media day in, day out. Colonel, there is a lot of speculation that Russia has stepped up its attempts to seize the steel plant, which is the last holdout there in Mariupol, in order to have some kind of victory that Vladimir Putin can declare on Monday, May 9th, which commemorates the Soviet Union's victory against the Nazis. What does capturing Mariupol give Russia militarily? Yeah, it, it, it does. It, it plays a, a significant emotional uh, role in, in what the Russians are doing. And, and I think that uh, there's there's a lot of credibility to the argument that that's what Putin is trying to do. And maybe that's why they're trying to accelerate this to get it done by uh, May the 9th, because the, there's a lot of history in, in Mariupol and, and a lot of it, uh, a lot of bad blood between uh, Ukraines and, and, and Russians in that area, uh, going all the way back to 2014 when the original uh, you know, uh, war started there, the, the civil warish kind of thing with, that Russia participated in, uh, and that the Azov Battalion, which was the primary defender and, and whose troops are still in the Azovstal uh, complex, uh, have reportedly killed lots of Russian-speaking people in that area over the years, and, and they had lots of bad blood. And so when Russia says they want denazification, the primary target they had in mind is the Azov Battalion. So to take that and to complete the destruction of that uh, battalion in the Azovstal on May 9th, I think, would be a big uh, PR effort for, for Putin. I think that's what he's trying to do. Yeah, and there are reports that there may even be some parades, as macabre as that may sound, on May 9th there in, in Mariupol itself. Um, just imagine that, given the devastation unfolded upon that city. Jill, this is a really important issue I'd like to raise with you. Talk about the significance of May 9th in Russia. Listen, my parents grew up there in the Soviet Union. Um, it, it is of high importance to Russians currently as it was to Soviets um, decades ago. And it's important for our viewers to understand just how ingrained this date is in Russian society and why Putin's narrative that his so-called special military operation in Ukraine 
to root out Nazis, as crazy as that may sound to the rest of the world, why it's so effective with millions of Russians? Oh, there's no question, Bianca, and you understand this very well. I mean, May 9th, the victory uh, by the Soviet Union over Nazi Germany is extraordinarily important. It always has been. And President Putin now, I think, is since he is building somewhat of an ideology about modern Russia, he combines this. This is really the, the core of his image of Russia. And he believes uh, that Russia, number one, saved the world during World War II. And this is not to demean what the Soviet Union did, no question, but that this, the Soviet Union, Russia, is the savior of the world, and also a very strong element of suffering and national angst, and uh, that plays into it too. So you're dealing with high emotion at this point. And then his linking it to World War II and Nazis is precisely what we're talking about in this war in Ukraine. He said, as everyone knows, that he is trying to denazify the country. So linking those with what's going on in Russia right now, you know, there's a high level of, of um, I would say, uh, rehabilitation of Stalin, a kind of militarization of the society, including with young people. And so this is, the, you know, he is playing with, I think, the concept of a nation in this and linking it to what's going on in Ukraine, no question. Such important historical context there. Uh, Jill Doherty, Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis, thank you so much. Thank you.